Okay, great. Welcome to the second day of uh, the MyFault workshop. Uh, our first speaker today is going to be Elina Romeva from UBC. Thanks, Pablo, and thanks everyone for coming. So today I'll tell you about non-parametric density estimation under a constraint called total positivity. And the talk will mostly be focused on maximum likelihood estimation under this constraint. Um, so, um, as I said, I'll be talking about non-parametric density estimation. So here we're given IID samples from an unknown distribution on RD with density P, and you'd like to estimate P. And unlike the case of parametric density estimation, where we assume P lies in some family, like the Gaussians, and we have finitely many parameters, um, in the non-parametric case, we assume that P lies in some non-parametric family. So for example, we can impose shape constraints like convexity, uh, monotonicity, or some kind of smoothness. Uh, and this is an infinite dimensional problem. And we um, also need to make sure that our constraints are strong enough so that there's no spiky behavior. So if, for example, we didn't impose strong enough constraints, then the estimate would just be a sum of the rack delta functions on the samples. But we also need constraints that are weak enough so that uh, the function class is large and it contains the original density. Um, and so people have studied uh, many different types of density estimation. So here are some examples, like monotonically decreasing densities, convex densities, log concave densities. Uh, also, generalized additive models where you assume the density can be written as a sum of one of the first three, and then you try to estimate each of the three summons. And today I'll tell you about totally positive and log concave densities. Uh, in particular, I'll also tell you a lot about log concave density estimation because it's going to be part of the assumption uh, for us as well. So what are totally positive distributions and why do we care about them? So distribution with density P on a subset of RD is called multivariate totally positive of order two or MTP2, which is the, what I'll call it from now on, if uh, it satisfies the, the following constraint. So for every two points X and Y, P of X times P of Y is less than or equal to P of X min Y times P of X max Y. So if we're in R2 and these are X and Y, we have that P of this times P of this is less than or equal to P of this times P of this. Um, and so uh, if P is positive and you take logs, then uh, log of P is supermodular, so it satisfies these linear constraints. Okay, so it's the same thing but with the log taken. Okay, so why are we studying this? So first I'll tell you that um, some nice mathematical properties of these MTP2 distributions. So first of all, MTP2 is actually a very strong form of positive dependence between the coordinates of the random vector. So in particular, it implies positive association. So uh, recall that a random vector in RD is positively associated if for any two non-decreasing functions phi and psi, the covariance of phi of x and psi of x is non-negative. And for example, you can choose the i-th coordinate and the j-th coordinate. So that means that the, cover the covariances of the coordinates are not negative, but this is much stronger. And MTP2 is even stronger. And what's nice is that if you have an MTP2 random vector, then any marginal distribution is MTP2. So if you just take a subset of the coordinates, that will also be MTP2. Any conditional distribution will be MTP2. And also it satisfies these Gaussian-like properties where xi is independent of xj if and only if the covariance, is, covariance of xi and xj is zero. So the last is satisfied also by positively associated variables, but these two are not. And um, this is uh, unlike in the, po in the positively associated case, uh, because um, we saw yesterday in the last talk there was an example of uh, two variables which seem to be positively correlated, but when you uh, conditioned on a third variable, they were negatively correlated. But here this never happens, so there's never this U Simpsons paradox. So uh, you start off with MTP2 variables, and however you marginalize or condition, you remain MTP2. So that's sort of a nice property. Um, OK, and so those are some nice mathematical properties, but um, what about real world distributions that satisfy it, MTP2? So it turns out that it um, comes up in many settings. So for example, uh, in phylogenetics via uh, Brownian motion tree models, uh, those turn out to be MTP2. Also um, in financial data, so stock market prices, uh, they sort of go up and down together, potentially because they're influenced by some global um, 
confounder that influences the whole market. And um, for example, if you look at test scores, uh, if, you're, if you answer well on some of the questions, then you're very likely to answer well on the others because there's probably some hidden variable like uh, how good you are at the subject and then uh, your test scores are very positively dependent. And it turns out that indeed if there is some hidden variable um, which influences all of the observed ones, like in the test scores, this could be your mathematical ability and these could be all your scores, then um, at least in the Gaussian and binary cases, uh, you can show that these variables are positive, uh, they're MTP2, so their distribution actually is MTP2. And also many models are already MTP2. So for example, ferromagnetic easing models, order statistics of IID variables, Brownian tr motion tree models that I mentioned above, and uh, all Gaussian binary latent tree models, for example, the single, uh, single factor analysis model. And um, well, it's possible that maybe um, you have to change the signs of some of the variables to make it MTP2, like they might be very negatively correlated, but you have to flip some of them to make them positively correlated. So this is called signed MTP2. So um, these are actually signed MTP2, um, these examples. Okay. Um, also, when is a Gaussian uh, random vector MTP2? So suppose that X is Gaussian with mean mu and covariance sigma, uh, then it's MTP2 whenever sigma inverse is an M matrix, meaning that um, the off-diagonal entries, sigma inverse ij, are all non-positive. Okay, and um, so this is a very rare condition. For example, in this paper by Falat, oh, they sampled 100,000, they uniformly sampl sampled 100,000 um, correlation matrices. So, you know, you have ones on the diagonal and it's a positive definite matrix, and none of them were MTP2. So it's a very rare condition. However, um, uh, here's a data set of the grades of 88 students in five math subjects, and this is the covariance matrix. And if you take the inverse covariance, the inverse of this, there was a sample covariance, if you take the inverse, it's basically an M matrix. There's just two entries that are almost zero. So it looks like even though it's a very rare condition, um, it appears in the real world potentially because of these confounders that make the variables uh, be quite dependent on each other. Okay, so here's another example. These are the monthly, co monthly correlations of the stock market prices in 2016. And um, this is the sample covariance. And if you take the inverse, it's an M matrix already. So it looks like these <coughs> are, yeah. Sorry, just a question on the previous example. If if I'm close to an M matrix, am I close to positively associated or something like that? You know, the MPP, Positively associated. You know, uh, am I, do I almost have the properties you mentioned on the previous slide or it's not clear? Um, I don't know. Okay. In the Gaussian setting, you just look at all the, the correlation matrix. If all of the entries are positive, and in this case, you look at, you look at X, all of the entries are positive. So this is positively associated. Yeah, in the Gaussian. Yeah. Okay, and so today I'll tell you about maximum likelihood estimation under the MTP2 constraint. So we'll be given IID samples in RD, and we could also put weights on them. If you don't like the weights, you can just forget about them, but they'll just be summing to one, non-negative, uh, from the unknown distribution with density P, and we would like to estimate P. And um, so we'll be doing maximum likelihood estimation. So the log likelihood is given as the sum of wi log of p of xi, and we have the constraint that p is an MTP2 density. Okay, so it turns out that this is not a strong enough constraint because if you take your samples, x1 up through xn, and then you um, sort of, for this MTP2 constraint to work, if you remember it was p of x times p of y is less than or equal to p at the minimum times p at the maximum, we kind of need there to be some weight at the minimum and the maximum in order for the density to be MTP2. So if we add all the pairwise minima and maxima um, until this, this is sort of a min-max closed set, I'll define this later, and we just, and we take a sum of Dirac's on this, that will be MTP2 and it will have an infinite likelihood. So, um, so this is an unbounded problem. And so this MTP2 constraint is actually too weak and we need to add something else. Uh, so uh, in this work we added uh, log concavity. So we assume that, MTP, that P is uh, MTP2 and also log concave. 
So a function is log concave if its logarithm is concave. And this was a choice that we made. And some reasons for this are that um, it's a natural assumption because it will make our density continuous on the domain. And it includes many known families of parametric distributions like Gaussians, um, uniform, and gamma, and beta for some values of the parameters. And also, people have, had already studied maximum likelihood estimation under just log concavity. Okay, so this is uh, the problem that we are looking at. And um, now I'm actually going to tell you a little bit about the log concave density estimator, uh, maximum likelihood estimator. So here, we'll, for now, we'll forget about MTP2, and I'll tell you a little bit about what's known about log concave maximum likelihood estimator. So consider now the problem where we're maximizing the likelihood such that P is a log concave density. Uh, so there's this very nice result by Q, Samworth, and Stewart that with probability one, the log concave Emily exists and is unique as long as there are at least a d plus one samples. And this probability one comes from the fact that you want the d plus one samples to um, form a full dimensional, their convex hull to be full dimensional. And uh, moreover, the log of p hat is a tenth function, I'll tell you what that is, supported on the convex hull of the data. So suppose that uh, this is the data here, all of these points at the bottom, and then um, so log of p hat has to be concave, right? Because p hat is log concave. Um, and so this is a piecewise linear concave function. And the way you form it is you imagine placing a tenth pole of some height above each of the samples, x up to xn. And then you put a tarp above all of these tenth poles and you make a tenth. And that's how you form your piecewise linear uh, concave function. And uh, log of p hat is zero outside, is, is negative infinity outside of this convex hull. So you just like make the tarp go all the way down and then you take uh, the exponential of that to get p hat, it's um, a log concave function which is zero outside of the convex hull. And uh, let me tell you a little bit more about these 10 functions mathematically. So given um, our n points, x1 up through xn with heights of the tent poles y1 up to yn. So above each point, I'll put a, a tent pole of height yi. The tenth function hxy from rd to r is the smallest concave function such that above xi, it's bigger than or equal to yi. So it's exactly what I said, but uh, defined rigorously. So it's not necessary that each of the tent poles touch the tent because maybe, like for example, this one is too short and it just doesn't go all the way up. Um, so we have this inequality. And so, the previous theorem shows that the estimator is the exponential of such a function. And this is very nice because the original optimization problem is infinite dimensional. So you're maximizing over all log concave densities. This seems pretty hard. But now we know that we don't need to do this. We can just maximize over the ones that are uh, of this form. So we can just uh, substitute p with x of h, x, y. So we did this on the right. And then um, this simplifies, so you can cancel out the log and the exp, so you get this uh, sum of h of xi. And in fact, it turns out that you can just substitute h of xi with yi because um, we're maximizing over the tenth pole, so we could just assume that they all touch the tenth. That will just increase the, uh, so if we take this objective instead, you'll give us the same answer. So this is the, new optimization problem, it's finite dimensional, we're maximizing a linear function over um, this constraint that the exponential is a density. And um, this just means that the integral is one and there's actually a really nice trick that you can do instead of having this constraint that the integral is one, you can just subtract it from the objective. And it turns out that at the maximizer, uh, the maximizing vector y, this integral is equal to one. Okay, so this is um, the optimization problem, and this is actually a concave function. It's not um, differentiable, but you can use subgradients to optimize it, and that's how their algorithm works. Sorry, so is it obvious that this is finite dimensional? I mean, the, the, the way h is defined is not a finite dimensional statement, right? So it's like the smallest concave function such that. Uh, yeah, but this is, now we're just optimizing over the, the heights y. So instead of having the, f so h is defined, if you have the heights y, you can compute this integral. So this integral like, um, so h is piecewise linear above each of these triangles or polytopes. 
So you can just compute h um, from y. So it's, this is just a function of y, and you're just maximizing the function of y. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, and h is not, um, yeah, depending on the heights, it's, uh, it's not differentiable. Um, this has no constraints. You, this. Okay, let's go back to the constraint one then. Um, so how many constraints? I mean, it's not it's not linear. So. Uh, Is this a complex program or can you optimize it? Uh, yeah. If you put less than or equal to one, it's convex. Um, yeah, I think it's just much. harder. I mean, yeah, this is a convex body, but it's not linear. Okay. It's sort of curved. Um, it shouldn't be easy if you're computing for convex height. Sorry? It shouldn't be easy if you're computing convex height. Okay. Yeah, yeah, even computing, the, yeah, computing this function is harder. So you have to, for each y, you need to figure out, yeah, you need to compute the convex hull. Oh, you mean just computing the objectives? Yeah, just computing objectives, yeah, so that's. Yeah. Um. Okay, so um, no, I forget it's in kinda n on n. Yes. Can you solve the problem? Yep. It's a numeric only synthesis. And you get it like for each choice of y. So for each choice of y. Yeah, you just you need to use compute objectives and optimize over y. Yes. I mean that's what uh, their algorithm does. They just compute the objective. So you just take the convex hull of like you concatenate x and y, x i, y i. That's in R D plus one, and you take this upper convex hull to get this um, tent, and then you know, um, and then you get get the facets, and then you compute the function. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you can also get a formula for its derivative. The. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so I'll now tell you what happens when we add the MTP2 constraint. So we'll try to answer similar questions to the ones that um, I just told you about in, in the lock concave case. So does the MLE under lock concavity in MTP2 exist with probability one? And if so, is it unique? Then um, what is the shape of the MLE? Is it, again, the exponential of a 10th function? Um, are all 10 functions possible if it was the exponential of a 10th function? And then how can we compute it? And what's the sample complexity? So it turns out that, again, we can show that the MLE under log concavity in MTP2 exists and is unique with probability 1 as long as there are at least three samples. So this is actually dimension independent because, um, as you see later, we have when you get the samples, you have to add uh, all of the pairwise minima and maxima and um, to form this min-max convex hull. And when you do this, even when you have three samples of probability one, this, this set will have a full dimensional convex hull. And furthermore, it's consistent. However, the proof um, just uses convergence properties for log concave distributions and doesn't shed any light on the shape of the MLE. Whereas in the log concave case, you can very easily see that it's the exponential of a 10 function. So you can see that if you take any, if you suppose the MLE was um, you know, log of something concave, you can easily show that a, a tenth function uh, uh, achieves a better MLE, and so therefore the MLE has to be the exponential of a tenth function. And so here we have to work to show that it is of that form. And so I actually begin by talking about the support of the MLE. So remember in the log concave case, the support was the uh, convex hull of the samples. So imagine that these darker points are our samples. So 
and the log concave case, this is their convex hull. But now we want our MLE to be MTP2. So if you pick these two points, for example, we, we need P of this times P of this to be less than or equal to P of this times P of this. So this needs to have uh, a non-zero weight, a non-zero value. And similarly for this, this is the maximum of these two points. So basically, um, the support has to be min-max closed. And um, it also has to be convex because we want the emily to be uh, log concave. And so the support has to be the min-max convex hull of the samples, which is the smallest min-max closed and convex set containing x. And uh, let me define another set in order to um, see how to find this. So um, let's take the samples x and let's define mm of x to be the smallest min-max closed set containing x. So this is a discrete set, uh, which is just, um, it contains x, and for every two points in it, their minimum and maximum are there. Uh, whereas this one here is the whole, it's a, it's a convex and min-max closed set. Okay, so we have these two sets. And the question is how to find this one, which, because this is the support of the MLE. So it's the min-max convex hull of the samples. And um, on first thought, it seems like you should just find the min-max closure of the samples, and then take the convex hull. Okay, because you want a min-max closed and convex set, so maybe that's the way to do it. But <coughs> it turns out that this is not always true. So if you first take the min-max closure, and then you take the convex hull, that's not necessarily equal to the min-max convex hull. And this is hard to see, because in R2, this is true. So, so it turns out that if x is a subset of R2, or um, it's binary, so it's the subset of the vertices of a, u of a hypercube, then the min-max convex hull is equal to the convex hull of this min-max closure. And so that's how we can find it. So, um, you know, if x is in R2, you can just find, I mean, this would be um, slower, but you can find the min-max closure of x and then um, take the convex hull of that. Um, okay, but the question is, how would we find it in higher dimensions? So how would we even find what the support of the MLE is? And um, so let me show you an example of uh, how it gets complicated. So, so this is a tetrahedron in R3. So if our samples were just these four points in R3, so 000, 600, 640, and 842, then um, this is a min-max closed set. So you know, uh, basically these points are in order. So the pairwise minimum, minimum and maximum of each two is the same two points back. So mm of x equals x, but um, its convex hull is not min-max closed. The so convex hull is just a tetrahedron, and it turns out it's not min-max closed because um, there's this point here, 6, 4, 3 halves, which is the maximum of um, 6, 4, 0 and 6, sorry, and 6, 3, 3 halves. Yes, so 6, 3, 3 halves is here on this segment. And um, so that point, clearly doesn't lie in the tetrahedron. And so therefore, in general, the convex hull of MMX is a strict subset of the min-max convex hull. Um, but nevertheless, uh, there is still a way to compute uh, this min-max convex hull. It's just a little bit more involved. So let me tell you, so there's um, this theorem called the 2D projections theorem that's uh, due to Bergman from Berkeley in the 70s. Um, so for a finite subset x, how do we compute the min-max convex hull? So uh, let pi ij be the projection onto the ith and jth coordinates. So what we have to do is we have to project on each of the pairs of coordinates, find the min-max convex hull there, and then take the inverse image and intersect them. So, so here, take the sample, project it, find the min-max uh, closure and take the convex hull of that. That's everything is in R2. And then take the inverse image. So there are these cylinders that you intersect. And that's a convex body, a convex polytope. Uh, and that's precisely equal to the min max convex hull. So, sort of all of the facets, they have only, uh, there are only two uh, coordinates that vary because you're projecting onto i and j and then you're taking the inverse image. Um, and in fact, there's a, a different way to think about these um, 
polytopes which are min-max closed. So because our, um, our support of the MLE will be a min-max closed polytope, convex polytope. And so um, the, characteriz the characterization of min-max closed convex polytopes is that uh, all of their facet defining inequalities are, are bimonotone linear inequalities. So that means they're, they're only given by two, um, but the varying of two of the coordinates. And so here's a precise definition. So a linear inequality is bimonotone if it has this form, AIXI plus AJXJ plus B is less than or equal to zero. So see, there's only two of the, the coordinates, the other ones are gone, where these A and AJ, if they're both non-zero, they have opposite signs. And so in R2, there's only two coordinates, I and one and two. So every inequality in R2 looks like this, but this is what restricts it. So this says that um, the slope has to be positive. So, so this is our example in R2, and we couldn't allow negative slope. So this and this weren't allowed, so we had to just complete it like this. And um, in general, in Rd, each of the facets is given by something like this. Is there a more funny series version than finite for this result? Fine. Uh, like, yeah, oh. Like polytope with n vertices or k faces. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, we don't know. It. Yeah, that that would be a great result, actually. Yeah. I mean, in R two, it's not really that. Uh, anyways. Yeah, that would be great to have. I don't know of it. Um, okay, so great. So we know how to find the bin max convex hole. Basically, we can project on each of the pairs of coordinates and and then um, find the inverse projection. So it's at least we know what it is. Um, and and we can compute it. So it's slow, but we can compute it. So now. Uh, I want to tell you about the shape of the MLE and uh, whether or not it's the exponential of a tenth function. And so before that, suppose that the MLE was the exponential of a tenth function. So suppose that you have an MTP2 and log concave um, density, which is the exp of some tenth function h. So recall from one of the first slides that that would mean h satisfies these linear inequalities. So it's su super modular. And so what are the possible tenth functions, which are supermodular. When, when, how can we characterize those? Um, well, so we found the following characterization. A tenth function is supermodular if and only if all of the walls of the subdivision it, it induces are bimonotone. So I'll tell you what all of these mean. So a tenth function, a piecewise linear function, uh, which is concave, induces a subdivision on its support. So here, and it consists of all the polytopes above which it's linear. So for example, this one here is linear above this triangle and this triangle, and this one is linear above this triangle and this triangle. So these are subdivisions. And we want all of the separating walls, so in this case it would be these two segments, to be bimonotone. So they're, uh, you know, they're, um, hyper the quality that this hyperplane is given by has to be of this form from the previous slide, it's bimonotone. So it only has two coordinates and the weights have to be of opposite sign. So for example, this one is not bimonotone. This one has negative slope in R2, so it's not bimonotone. And you can even see how this 10 function is not supermodular because suppose that x and y were here on this uh, segment. Here's h of x and here's h of y. And their sum is two times this middle point, but the sum of the, the min and the max is below. It's two times the midpoint, which is below. So you can easily see how this, um, these two are sort of equivalent. But the problem is that uh, if you consider all the heights that induce such subdivisions, the set of such heights is not convex. So if we wanted to optimize over all such supermodular functions, then that would be a non-convex problem. Because even in this really simple case, like as soon as one of the core, as soon as it's not binary, so there's one coordinate where you have three different values of it in the sample, you, um, you get a non-convex set of heights. OK, um, so, so we found which functions are bimonotone, 10 functions are bimonotone. And so now uh, 
when is the MLED exponential of a 10 function? So we were able to show that if x is uh, in R2, so in a two-dimensional case, or if it's binary, which will happen probably zero anyways, the MLE is the exponential of a 10 function. And it's given, so it's uh, p star, which is the exponential of h. And then this 10th function, its 10 pole locations now have to be at the min max closure of x. So you have to add all pairwise minima and maxima. So in the lock concave case, the 10 poles were just above n points, but now this is above way more points. About, it's about n squared. Um, okay, and how can we compute it? So it turns out that um, we can use exactly the same optimization problem as in the log concave case. So in the log concave case, we're maximizing over heights of this function, but now we just add these linear constraints. Um, and so there's going to be, in R2, there's going to be about n squared of them. Um, uh, so basically, yeah, so, the, so we can find the MLE by solving this optimization problem. So we're maximizing the same function as in the log concave case where you have the likelihood minus the integral, but now we add some um, linear constraints and we can um, use, for example, the conditional gradient method or something like this to, to find it. And here's an example where we sampled, I think, um, 50 or 60 points from a Gaussian, standard Gaussian distribution. And the left one is the log concave MLE. And the right one is the log concave and MTP2 MLE with the same samples. Okay, so this one, you can see that um, uh, since we added the min max, so since we're using the min max closure, x tilde, then we have um, way more places where it bends. So it's just a, a smoother looking function. Um, okay. Or a rounder. Um, okay, so what is the shape of the MLE in the general case? And um, so we found this to be, we found it hard to prove that it's always the exponential of a 10 function. And let me show you one example. So the first question is, what is it in this one example where we had the tetrahedron and then we added this extra point to make it min-max load? So suppose that we have these five points and uh, we're just going to choose these random weights because uh, so these are the five points, and these weights make it so that the log concave MLE is not um, MTP2. So because if the log concave MLE is already MTP2, then the log concave and MTP2 MLE will be the same. And so you wouldn't need to, um, to do anything else. But if the log concave MLE is not MTP2, then we have to work harder to find uh, ours. And so it turns out that the MTP2 and log concave MLE in this case is um, a 10th function on a set which contains two extra points. So you have to add, so this, this is a min-max closed set. So the mm of x here is x. You don't have to add anything. So if it were to look like in the two-dimensional case, you would just have to put 10 poles above these five points. But it turns out that the MLE is a 10th function with 10 poles above seven points. So we had to add this point and this point. And uh, here I'm showing you the subdivision. So there's these two um, planes, the orange one and the green one, and they split this tetrahedron into four polytopes. And the, the MLE is piecewise linear above each of these four. So it's, um, it's a 10th function, but it's not obvious how to get the 10 pole locations. And so um, we believe that the MLE is always a 10th function. So for a while, we thought maybe this one would be a Gaussian or something, but it just um, it turned out it's a 10 function. Uh, and, I, and I think, so our conjecture is that there exists some set x tilde where x is a sub, the sample is a subset of x tilde, uh, such that the MLE looks exactly like before and can, and can be computed like, uh, with this optimization problem. But the problem is, what is x tilde? And we have some conjectures uh, just given by this construction, which tell us how to find x tilde. But basically, something we could prove is that if this optimization problem gives us an MTP2 function, then this is it. Then this is the actual MLE. And the problem is showing that this will give us an MTP2 function. Um, OK, so let me tell you a little bit about sample complexity. So here the story is also we can do it in R2. And um, 
we, we have a conjecture for uh, d higher than 2. So, um, so let fd be the set of log concave and MTP2 densities, and here we'll be looking at the squared Hellinger distance. And Pn hat will be our MLE. So then we can show the upper bound. So this upper bound is just the upper bound that comes from log concave density estimation. So without the MTP2 constraint. And there it's, in general, uh, n to the negative 2 over d plus 1 um, up to log factors. And then, um, so here we just showed the lower bound is the same also as in the log concave case. So basically, um, the MLE in R2 is minimax optimal, but it has the same rate as the log concave MLE. So it doesn't. It, it doesn't get better even though we shrunk the class a lot. And so our hope is that it does get better in, uh, for d bigger than or equal to 3, but this is a very, um, I mean, that we were really hoping for this, but um, haven't shown this yet. So we believe that it will stay, um, it will stay the same because basically, okay, so we have two reasons. Um, one is that when you take x and you add all the pairwise minima and maxima to find this mm of x, you get about n to the d points, which is also um, something that we have to prove. Um, and then, so they're dependent, but they're kind. But you know that um, our our hope is that we can kind of use them like sample, like they're actual samples although they're dependent. And then the other reason is that the support is given by these bimonotone inequalities, which only vary in two of the coordinates. And somehow that might uh, help in the proof of, of the upper bound. OK. Um, so this is all I wanted to tell you about um, MTP2 and log concave density estimation. So let me tell you about, let me conclude and tell you about a couple of other things. So first of all, there's a lot of uh, remaining questions, for example, showing that it's always the exponential of a 10 function, finding the rates, and finding faster ways of finding the MLE. Um, and next, I wanted to tell you about another condition that you can add to the MTP2 condition. So I was very fortunate to be part of this project with Philippe and his students, JC and Cheng, um, uh, looking at MTP2 and beta holder smooth densities in the plane. Uh, and uh, there, you can come up with a piecewise constant estimator and upper and lower bounds. And the way to do it would be, um, so if you look at densities on the unit square, you can sort of uh, discretize it and um, estimate a matrix, an MTP2 matrix, by just, uh, so we're, we, we, yeah, the, the estimator is piecewise constant on a discretization of the square. And to get it, uh, you kind of do a discrete MTP2 estimator first. Uh, so that's one way. And it would be um, nice to do, to look at this estimator in higher dimensions. You can do the same, you can find the same estimator in higher dimensions. Uh, and it would be nice to find what the rate is in that case. Um, and then another thing that I looked at with a Europe student last year was what if we just take the sample, uh, find the min-max closure, and then um, convolve with the Gaussian, so do some uh, kernel density estimation, but with this mm of x. And we showed that the if you convolve this min-max closure with a Gaussian, that actually gives an MTP2 function, which was not obvious because in general, convolutions of MTP2 functions are not MTP2. Um, and um, however, it's not clear that this is even consistent. Like it's not clear that if you, instead of your sample, you use mm of x, it's not clear that that's consistent. So that's actually a pretty interesting question. Um, and you might actually need to put weights on this min-max closure. And then um, also we see that MTP2 is quite common, but it would be nice to have test statistics for those. And uh, I'm mathematically interested in, um, MTPK, so this was MTP2, but what is uh, it if you, <coughs> instead of two, look at K? So these were sort of looking at two by two minors of matrices, but now um, TPK in a matrix case is uh, positivity of K minors. How can you extend it to multivariate um, settings? Thanks. If 
if I have a density that I know is NCP2, but with respect to some different coordinate system, mm. right? Is, is that something I can estimate? Is something that I can test? And you have to find the coordinate system? Yeah, exactly. Can I, or like do the MLE, but I, it's NCP2 with respect to some uh, coordinate system. That sounds interesting. Yeah, I don't know. That sounds cool. Yeah. So what do the worst case densities look like when you build the minimax load balance? For? For MCP2 in, uh, in the open case. For the lower, yeah, for lower band, we used Aswad's lemma. I mean, I can, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, so they were, um, okay, so you take the, um, you, you take these polytopes that are kind of, um, they have to have positive slope, and then I think you put a uh, constant on that, and you make it so that, um, yeah, for each one you remove an equal amount, so they're all the same constant. So that was, yeah, that was the, those were. Yeah, so there are bumps on these polytopes that are kind of like this, and for log concave, they do it, but you can cut off any, um, anything. But here we can just cut off positive slope, so, and there are, yeah. Yeah, because it's the same, like, it's just, yeah, anyway. So in your picture, it seemed to indicate that, let's say, for example, for Gaussian density, you're doing a better job, right? So rather than looking at the minimax rate, would you look at, like, how, like, even in terms of upper bounds, can you get better upper bounds than what's available if I were to estimate the standard Gaussian in CD using MLE for log and K versus uh, MLE for uh, log and K for MCP2? Just for Gaussian? Yeah. yeah, I don't think so. I, mean, I don't know. I mean, Caroline worked on some Gaussian MCP2, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think so. Not that I know of. So what do you do with, I mean, so, so these uh, estimators, not the estimators, I guess the estimators, what kind of operations can you do efficiently with them afterwards? I mean, somehow once, th these are the optimal MLE mm -hmm. estimates, but somehow are that useful later for something? Like <laughs> um. You can use them for anomaly detection since you have this source correctness. Yeah, or you can compute marginals or some or conditional. But I don't know, but yeah, I don't know. Mm. I guess yeah, okay. anomaly detection. If there's no other questions or comments, I'm gonna thank Elena again.